Chapter 4 Lancaster found Norman in the sewers the next day, and he as he and his imp familiar, although invisible, left through a ladder going up toward the stables. Once outside and up top, Norman informed Lancaster of what has transpired. So the dragon was being controlled by a demon here, just as the same one attacked Hypos yet was staged here. These enslavers are witty if I didn't know better. Either that or they actually have a leader, which seems likely at this point. Is it this Fenro's character? Lancaster inquired. Doubtful, said Norman. Some one-on-one -on -one time with this person may reveal his or her identity to us, however. Lancaster spoke in detail to Norman between two large baskets of straw in the early morning of dawn before how the about how the white wizards are no longer true immortals, how even they can kill now if need be, and how that can be an asset now, as things are getting worse. While Lancaster looks middle-aged, he assures Norman that he will age eventually, although extremely slow. The black mages of Ebony Tower still cling to their mysterious immortality, though, and loom over the world now as a threat that only Lancaster is truly aware of. Lancaster is no longer in the position of Archmage of the White Tower, but a mere feudal wizard, where his settlement was built around his tower. The story goes that in the desert people were parched for water and resources, and weary of the ramp rampant dust storms. They started to settle around the wizard with his permission, as he had used his magic to create a small forest oasis around his tower. Now the people of the desert enjoy Lancaster in his honor, a small town of nearly 100 settlers. The day was starting in the, in the gleaming empire of Silverstone City, home of the illustrious Warriors Guild, who have saved and protected the city since its inception. Battle-hardened soldiers and adventurers alike who cling to the old ways of honor and glory, although they do not pledge full loyalty to their King Hydus. They do his duties for him across the world abroad, and for others they do also for a fee. In the barrels of the city, in the lower alleys, a group of men appearing to be vagabonds except for one in, is in communion. One looks like he is rich, with linen silk and a gold golden and round red ring with a serpent on it. All the shadows in the valley come to life with movement as a blob of red membraned eyes, small and round and steam, hiss forth from it, even in broad daylight. It is a bazaar, a very powerful demon. A bazaar are thousands of lesser demons who have merged into one spirit, more or less, yet retain their consciousness, but combine all their power. It waits behind the finely dressed man as his servant. The men, the men in rags notice something moving in the ground beneath them and swallow, and eyes open with fear, and one puts his hand over the top of his head looking down. You were supposed to find out the whereabouts of Ethan the Black, so... Jacoby, did you? Jacoby hesitated. Um, no, sir, I was accosted by a witch hunter. The man didn't flinch, running his middle finger through his long brown hair, clean and well kept. The plan to attack both cities succeeded as planned. Are you telling me the diversion was for nothing? He asked calmly. But he destroyed my needler demon like it was nothing, he spake loudly. Halt, said a guard as he passed by. The bazaar snapped back into the wall. He overheard the commotion. You lot looked like you were up to no good. The mysterious leader then said to the guard, You have nothing to fear from us, soldier. I am merely giving food and gold to these beggars. The guard's eyes move away fast and back again, and he says, Very well. Just don't let me catch you in the alleys again. The guard with magnif magnificent silver and bronze armor, with the crest of a red dragon on the center of his chest piece, and wielding a well-made longsword and shield played with gold around his edges, the king of Silverstone was very rich, but compared to many feudal kings, the honorable and ethical sort. The group disbanded, and the mysterious well-dressed man headed toward the Temple of the Serpent, an order that realizes the dragons of the ethereal realm as gods. Although the powerful ones are bound there, they cannot escape. Once a dragon takes on physical form, it loses much of its grand power. Few exist, exist outside of the land of dreams. But the ones that do 
are generally passive by nature. Movak, the god of death, is in the visage of a dra uh, uh, is in the visage of a demonic dragon, though he is not one at all. Though some believe he may have been long ago, Norman and Lancaster are riding horseback toward Mirak, the city of desolation and ruin, the dark safe haven for most of this world's villainy. The rising power there is the Order of Movak, priests of the God of Death. They supply the Ebony Tyra wizards with their infant sacrifices for the atrocious ritual of the unspeakable to retain their fabled immortality by appeasing the God of Death. Their method of choosing mothers isn't certain, but the outcome is the same. How are we going to pull this off, Lancaster? Norman asked, looking at his side as they ride horseback on a road in the woods outside of Murek. The road lined with old graveyards and tombs. The trees covered with dark moss. I have our credentials. It is up to us. We must play the part perfectly, replied Lancaster. As they get deeper into Murek territory, the sun darkens under a canopy of trees as they ride on. Cemeteries now turning into abandoned altars and fenced murals. Our goal is to either liberate Ether or kill him. If he, will, if he has become one of the Ebony Tower's lackeys, I will not hesitate, Lancaster. Surely you know, said Norman in a serious tone. Lancaster then responds, I do not believe Ethan stole the piece, but I have no doubts he is now in the hands of the Ebony Tower. I believe he had no choice but to join forces with them or die. We will give him a chance first. The pair learned of Ethan's whereabouts from the captured enslaver. It seems they were behind his capture, revealing something that no one had known before, even though many suspected it. The enslavers are working with the Ebony Tower. As they ride steadily on, slowly at first, then the horses rear up and start galloping fast. They are spooked. A lone wolf, dark gray with black, about half as tall as the horse, runs up toward Norman's horse who is on the right. To its right, it chomps at the horse's feet. Lancaster raises his staff straight up, up above him, and a wave of force blasts from the staff's top, narrowly missing Norman's head, and knocks the wolf back into a, a tree hard, impaling it on a blunt, st blunt, stumpy branch. They halt their horses and stop, and hop off and walk them to an empty patch in the thick forest. Let us make camp. It is almost. It is getting dark soon," said Lancaster, breathing out hard one good time. The orange sun gleaming beams through the close together trees and carved out stone hills. Lancaster thinks to himself, "The ebony tower awaits me as well, Ethan." Uh, squinting toward the sun and the trees, as the sun sets upon the horizon, the two approach the mirror checkpoint manned by two heavily armed guards and a battle mage armed with only a shield. What is your business here? One of the guards says to Lancaster and Norman. The other guard says, perhaps they are lost, hovering his hand close to his mace. Lancaster, still on horseback, says, we have our credentials. We are shadow priests returning from a secret mission into the dark wood. The guard snatches the paper angrily and reads it, handing it back to Lancaster. Very well, then. I suppose you can go on your way off, then. They rode on into the outskirts of the city, the pass covered in cement, and on the edges blazing furnaces lining their edges. Mirk has no burial rites. They simply burn their dead into ashes in these huge braziers and give the remains to the ebony tower for use. As they slowly rode past, piles of clothes fresh bodies were being slid into the flames. They were approached by a dark hooded and robed man with an injured and ghost white left eye. He humbly looked at the two as they were riding and asked, Good sirs, be ye priests of the shadow or of the fire? They looked at each other with a confirming gaze, and Norman gave a single nod and Lancaster replied, Yes, we are priests of the shadow and have just returned. The strange man pulled away a large piece of cloth he was carrying with both hands and revealed an infant inside. This is my young daughter Matilda. Please take her to your fellow priests. A small gift from the people to the shadow and fire for blessing these lands for so long. 
Lancaster still horseback but stopped, and Norman still moving ahead slowly. He looks at the man and says, I could not do this. We're not taking any donations at this time. Our reasons are our own. The dark robed man in a fit in a fit yelled, To hell with you then. She dies here now. He throws the clothed infant into one of the braziers and smiles a demented smile. Lancaster's eyes widen and he uses a teleport spell before the infant hits the bottom. The baby screams silenced. The man reared back and uttered, You are no priest. Forbid magics. You're a witch. And took off running toward the city. Lancaster drew his staff and teleported the man mid-stride off to some unknown location.